not fully understand the case, and the courtroom was a scene of absolute confusion, both parties raging at one another. I committed oversights and omissions, and, and as I argued before the judge, yes? the horse died of old age. <laughs> <laughs> Forgive me, John. I'm sure you'd have won the case had the horse lived. Sam, I would have lost the case had the horse been a colt. Here I am, a true lawyer, sworn before the bar, losing cases to pettifoggers. Men with no training at all. The only cases I can get here now are those which should be settled by a fist fight. I'm a failure. No, John. Merely a lunatic. This comes from uh, living alone too long. Ah, <laughs> oh, I'd go mad here in six days with no one to argue politics but the poultry. <laughs> the only cure for you is to leave this farm for a while. But go to Boston? What if I met Mr. Gridley and he asked me about my problem? I'm not suggesting Boston. Weymouth will do. Your friend Dick Cranch wishes you to dine with him at the home of his fiancée, Miss Smith. I believe you know her father, Parson Smith? Oh, that crafty old snob, I'd rather stay at home. Cranch wears his fiancée, has two charming sisters. Uh, more reason not to go. I cut a poor figure among the ladies. Nonsense! It's true, Sam. I've fallen into a fearful habit whenever I meet one. I've become silent and forbidding. Or what is worse, I affect wit. I begin to shrug my shoulders and distort my face like a village fool. John, if you don't think you're good enough to dine with the parson and his daughters, I won't argue you're going. To our most gracious king, George III. George III. <clears throat> well, Mr. Cranch, what did you make of our new king's speech? I was very favorably impressed, sir. And you, sir? Mr. Adams? Well, I, I like the manner in which he declared himself a, a friend of liberty. I trust he will protect his subjects' rights. Do you truly think so, Mr. Adams? Well, I strive to speak only when I have considered what I will say, Miss Smith. Well, I would choose to wait before I would praise our new king. Abigail! Until such time as we can speak as well of his deeds as he speaks of his intentions. Pray forgive her, Mr. Adams. I fear our nabby is subject to these fits of opinion. It comes from a frail constitution and a too indulgent father. <laughs> More wine, Mr. Adams. It's evident, Mr. Adams, that these parish lands were deeded to my parsonage in perpetuity. Now, for the North Precinct of Weymouth to press a claim to them appears to be plain theft. I'm sure I don't know, Parson. Well, you're a lawyer. You must have some opinion. Well, I would first have to read the deeds myself. Excellent. I'll fetch them. Well, I'm no expert on property law, Parson. I trust okay. I trust your father runs no risk of losing his lands, Miss Smith. Don't despair for him, Mr. Adams. This dispute over the parish lands has been going on for 50 years. We don't settle matters in haste here in Weymouth. Well, my friend Cranch and your sister would seem to be the great exception. I understand they will marry shortly. Yes, we are happy for them. 
He is a good man and they are in love. I am myself insensitive to such feelings. Surely you don't consider love a weakness. In a poor man, it is a folly. But Richard is not poor. I understand he owns a thriving business. Oh, I was speaking of myself. <laughs> ah. I've noticed you do that quite often. Do you think me vain, Miss Smith? According to the great poet, self-love but serves to wake the virtuous mind. You read Pope? Aside from Shakespeare, there is no poet I so admire. How extraordinary. They're my favorites as well. Pray let us end this talk of poets. Father becomes quite cross if I discuss my books with strangers. But why? Parson's daughter is supposed to quote her Bible. Anything more is ostentation. Were you my daughter, Miss Smith, I would take great pride in your prodigy. Mr. Adams, as you are only ten years my senior, were you my father, you would be the prodigy. <laughs> Excuse me. Mr. Adams, how have you time for your farm and the law? Well, I've, I've none too many clients, Miss Smith. The one who interests me the most is uh, the apprentice to a weaver. When he signed his papers, his master promised to teach him to read. Now the master's refused to honor his part of the bargain. But what need has a weaver's boy with reading? Elizabeth, how can you ask that? Can a man live as a man in this world if he is denied his education? Indeed, Miss Smith. Our English constitution is grounded on the right of every man to think and act for himself. How else can he judge his government if he is kept ignorant of its acts? Only by reading in his Bible and in his newspaper, will he enlarge his range of thought, deny him an education, and all of us will suffer. Our liberty cannot be preserved without a general knowledge among the people. And they declared in favor of the apprentice in less than five minutes. Oh, I am pleased you came by to tell us this news. I was passing through Weymouth, and I, I thought I would study your father's deeds while I'm here. Ah. They are inside with Father. Miss Smith, the plain truth is I came today in hope of seeing you alone. I am alone. I would be less than candid if I did not say that you've made a most favorable impression on me. Thank you. Of all the women I've met, you, you appear to be the most honest, the least capable of craft or guile, and I admire that. It is always easy to admire qualities in others which we possess ourselves. Oh, Miss Smith, I would not have you think me better than I am. I, I fear I lack that virtue of speaking plainly that I find in you. Oh, I doubt that you... You, you must hear me out. I, I want your friendship more than any in this world, but you must know what I am. You will remember when I last spoke with your father, how I told him that I, I hated great estates and fame, and, and that I was content with the simple things of nature. Yes? I lust after fame. I dream of making a great name in the world. Mr. Adams, you need not tell me this. Moreover, you will recall when we spoke of the love between my friend Cranch and your, uh, your sister, how I claim to be insensible to such passions. You did sneer most marvelously. Oh, that was not my sneer. No? That was Gridley's sneer. Gridley's sneer? A great lawyer I met in Boston. I studied his sneer in the hope of procuring respect. Pray, Mr. Adams, where did you study your silence? Silence? Indeed, that icy silence. It often makes me tremble with the disapproval it implies. Well, that silence is my own. But the point I wish to make, Miss Smith, is that I am most susceptible to passion. Ever since I was a boy, I have struggled with my amorous disposition. Pray understand, I have always won that struggle. Mr. Adams, I wish to be your friend, not your confessor. You must know what I am. I have a dread of contempt. I would rather tell you my failings than have you discover them from others. 
I trust I have sufficient judgment of my own not to depend on the world's gossip for opinions. <laughs>